Good morning. It's Saturday, July 28th, 2018. It's 7 a.m. on the East Coast, and a three-hour Washington Journal is ahead for you this morning. In our 8 o'clock hour, we'll spend some time talking to American farmers. In our 9 o'clock hour, we'll hear from some of the country's police officers, but we begin this morning talking to American veterans. After a week that saw the confirmation of a new Veterans Affairs Secretary and President Trump address one of the nation's largest veterans groups, we're interested in hearing how veterans view President Trump and the Trump administration. So veterans only for this first segment, give us a call if you're a veteran in the Eastern or Central time zones. The number's 202-748-8000 if you're a veteran in the Mountain or Pacific time zones, 202-748-8001. You can also catch up with us on social media. On Twitter, it's at CSPANWJ. On Facebook, it's facebook.com slash CSPAN. And a very good Saturday morning for you. The pool of Americans we're looking to talk to in this first segment of the Washington Journal today, about 20 million strong, representing less than 10% of the total U.S. adult population. Those are some of the numbers on the United States veterans population, according to the Pew Research Center in one of their recent reports. Here's some numbers on when those veterans served. As of last year, there were 6.8 million American veterans who served during the Vietnam era. 7.1 7.1 million who served during the Gulf War era, which spans from August of 1990 through the present. There were also 771,000 World War II veterans and 1.6 million who served during the Korean conflict. About three quarters, 77% of veterans in the United States back in 2016 had served during wartime. 23% only ser- 23% served during peacetime. As we said, President Trump addressed one of the nation's largest veterans groups this week. That took place on Tuesday when President Trump spoke at the annual Veterans of Foreign Wars National Convention. It was in Kansas City, Missouri. Here's uh, one of the newspaper headlines from the next day. President Trump reaffirming his commitment to veterans is the headline there. He was accompanied to the VFW convention by the new Veterans Affairs Secretary Robert Wilkie. It was confirmed by the Senate on Monday night by a vote of 86 to 9. And as we said, we want to talk to veterans only in this first segment of the Washington Journal, getting your view of President Trump and the Trump administration as you're calling in. Here's a little bit of President Trump from that VFW convention on Tuesday talking about improvements to veterans' health care. As promised, we established the White House VA hotline and every VA medical center now offers same-day emergency mental health care, something very important. We're greatly expanding telehealth and walk-in clinics so our veterans can get anywhere at any time. They can get what they need. They can learn about the problem and they don't have to necessarily drive long distances and wait. We are also, it's been a very big success, we're also processing veteran disability claims more quickly than ever before, by far. The VA has implemented the decision-ready claims process where claims can be completed in under two weeks. We're striving for one day, but under two weeks. It used to be many, many months. By the way, if you want to watch that speech in its entirety, you can do so. Go to cspan.org. President Trump not strictly st- sticking to veterans' issues during that speech. Some criticism for uh, going to more campaign style issues during that speech to veterans. Here's the headline from NPR on that topic uh, a campaign style speech at the Veterans of Foreign Wars convention. Stars and Stripes also picking up on it, noting that at points during his speech on Tuesday, President Trump injected partisan politics into the nonpartisan event. He criticized Democrats for their immigration agenda and specifically singled out Missouri Senator Claire McCaskill for voting against the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. McCaskill is widely considered one of the most vulnerable Democrats up for re-election this fall. President Trump invited her challenger, Missouri Attorney General Josh Hawley, to stage, uh, in which Hawley uh, gave a few remarks as well. Following that speech, a tweet from the VFW National Headquarters Uh, noting that it's a long-standing VFW tradition to give our members the chance to hear directly from the sitting president on the issues that affect veterans, service members, and their families. Our members are from all walks, and the VFW is nonpartisan, they note. We only want what is best 
for veterans. And we've held open our phone lines for veterans in this first hour of the Washington Journal today. We want to hear from veterans only. Your view of President Trump and the Trump administration. Again, if you're a veteran in the Eastern or Central time zones, 202-748-8000 is the number. If you're a veteran in the Mountain or Pacific time zones, 202-748-8001. Middleton's up first from West Virginia. Middleton, good morning. Good morning. Go ahead, sir. Well, uh, I was in the Vietnam era from 1967 through 1970. And uh, I was drafted when I was still in high school. So I had no choice except I had to go into service. And here this person that we've got for president had five deferments, never offered to go into service. I never had a chance to be able to do this. You know, he is he is the most uh, disgrace for a president that you got. If that's what you want of my attitude, as he's not going to help the veterans. He's a liar. He constantly tells lies. And I wouldn't listen to him uh, with anything. And I wouldn't even trust him with uh, as far as I could throw him. Milton, on your, on your first point, do you think presidents, commanders in, in chief should serve in the military to, to be qualified to, to be president? Yes, I do. And why? You know, I, I never had no choice. Like I say, I was still in high school when I was drafted to, to go in. He he has got money. He has had money all of his life, so he could buy his way out of anything. The poor people down here like me, they had no choice. So they either went to service or a or, or deserter, or they uh, went to Canada. And in no way would I do anything like that. I'm a- That's Middleton, West Virginia this morning. Steve is in Robertsville, Missouri. Steve, go ahead. Uh, Good morning, John. Thanks for taking my call. Um, I watched our dear leader bragging about uh, the economy and everything. But you notice that, you know, when the good times come, if you're smart, you pay down your bills. But we're not paying down our bills. We have an enormous trillion-dollar debt, and we're spending more money than, than we ever spent, you know, before. Nothing's getting fixed. Our infrastructure... We're, we're subject to a hack in our electric grid. Um, our health care people are dying because they can't afford the drugs. And, um, you know, it's it's just you got to do something. It's it. You know how I put it to like, say you inherited one hundred thousand dollars and you owed one hundred thousand dollars on your house. Instead of paying off your house, you go party all the money away and then you go bankrupt. That's a, that's pretty much where we're going to. And the only ones that's being truthful with us, thank God for the FBI and Robert Mueller, because they're the only ones in our whole government that's telling us the truth. Steve, Steve, when did when did you serve? um, It was right. It was during Jimmy Carter years, right after the Vietnam War. It was in peacetime. But uh, I served uh, three years in the United States Marine Corps. You said when, when the good times come, you, we need to start taking care of ourselves, our economy. Are, are we taking care of our veterans? If, if this is the good times, are we using uh, the good times to take care of veterans? Uh, well, it, see, if we had universal health care, we wouldn't even need the VA. You know, we should, every veteran, even though you didn't serve in wartime, does that make me any less of an American? Does that mean I don't get to go to the hospital and... and um, you know, get things taken care of because I can't afford health care just because I didn't serve. And that includes all Americans. You know, if you're a real American, you don't have to be a veteran. You sh- you got a right to at least, you know, get your health care and stuff taken. And we're not taking care of none of this stuff. We're just spending money and just playing games and and running a crooked operation, <laughs> I think. So, um, hey, thank you, John. You all have a blessed day today. To Fayetteville, North Carolina, Jack. Good morning. When did you serve, Jack? Good morning, sir. It's uh, I've just listened to the other two uh, veteran comrades of mine. Uh, I too was a veteran back in the early '60s, a uh, real early '60s, like '61, '62. And it's interesting how we can all have different viewpoints about uh, presidents in general and and President Trump in particular, but. 
You know, I date back to the time when I remember as a boy, Harry Truman, all the way forward now to President Trump. And I must say, President Trump is is almost a duplication of Harry Truman. That is to say, he's uh, he's uh, up front. What you see is what you get and uh, transparent in that sense of the word. And and I would like to just say I disagree with my other two veteran brethren. I think Trump is the best thing that's happened in my lifetime. And I date back to Tr- uh, Truman, like I said, uh, actually born before before Roosevelt died. But, of course, I didn't know anything about Roosevelt. I'm sure he was a great president, however, because he con- he conducted this country through a world war successfully. So he had to have been a great president. But uh I can I can um, date Truman back to uh, or correlate Truman to uh, uh, to Trump and and Trump is another Truman and he's great he's he's yeah, going to be even coming back to one of those first callers you, you mentioned does it matter to you whether a commander in chief has served in the military? Absolutely not. Uh, absolutely not. Uh, he can uh, a commander in chief can surround himself with good men, and and Trump has. Just look at uh, Maddox, for example, and look at our Secretary of State, for example. Uh, uh, early on, now there were appointments kind of thrown on him by the GOP. He didn't have much of a choice. He had to get a government together in that first. 30 days or so, and there were appointments thrown at him, and so he he selected some folks there that the GOP wanted, that the establishment wanted, but now he's getting his cabinet together, and, and, and this country is moving forward big time. Jack, thanks for the call from North Carolina to Illinois, Chicago. William's up next. William, when did you serve? Uh, yes, good morning. How are you doing? Are you there? Yes, sir. When did you serve? Yes, I served in the first Desert Storm and the second Desert Storm. And what are your and thoughts also, I, on the current commander in chief? I have some major concerns about this uh, this president. I, I think he's a he's a clear and present danger for this country, foreign and domestic. On the foreign aspect, I, I think he is undermining NATO which I respectfully disagree with my brethren from North Carolina. Truman cult- forged and cultivated NATO. Trump is doing the opposite, okay? On, on a domestic level, he does not acknowledge white supremacy groups as terrorists. And I'm really concerned about that. He doesn't illustrate what America is supposed to be. Hello, are you there? Yes, sir. And what should America be, okay. William? America should be a this diverse nation that everyone contributes to this country. My ancestors were slaves, but they helped build this country. And they should be acknowledged, just as well as people of color should be acknowledged, as well as whites. And America, America stands for that. We we are the beacon of of the world, and with this president, he has pushed away from that idea. That's William in Chicago this morning. Kevin, El Paso, Texas. Next, good morning. Yeah, good morning. Um, I am actually cur- currently serving, and I retire from the army in five months. Um, I have served uh, with Bill Clinton, um, Bush, Obama and now Trump. Um, the, the, uh, the one thing I've noticed with Trump is that there's no bones about it that, that he loves us military. Um, the previous eight, eight years, the morale in my unit was very, was very low. Uh, with Bush, we were too busy going to wars, everything else. With Clinton, um, you know, in the military, uh, he, he, he cut us pretty good. No one liked him. No one liked him. So, um, probably do I think it's, it's requirement that you serve in the military, um, like Trump didn't. Well, Bush kind of did a couple years air, air, air national guard. That was about it. Obama didn't serve at all. Uh, Clinton got it. Def- you know, he was deferred not to serve either. So it's not really fair to, to base just one standard on Trump and not the others. 
So I, I fully support Trump. Um, I, I base my decision on results, not emotions, not how I feel, not his words. I, I look at actions. And right now, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy with Donald Trump. Kevin, why did you decide to make the military a, a career? Um, what it was, was I actually joined late in my life. I was uh, just shy of 33 years old. I, I joined the infantry, and I still am in, 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 in the infantry. I uh, deployed five times. I actually just got back last year. Um, it was to turn my life around. I, I wasn't, you know, I was heading down the wrong path. And at that time, I, I had to make a decision, and I thought, well, the one way I, I can change the, that direction, that path, uh, was join the military for a few years. Uh, my plan wasn't to serve 20 years, but that just when I got deployed, I actually looked like being deployed because I, I actually do my job. Um, doing training half the time back here in Garrison, is, it, it gets boring and it gets, we, we, we keep doing the same the same kind of training, it just gets boring. It's just like go, going through the motions. It's like rehearsals. Kevin, when, when um, you are deployed that. overseas, how often does the, the actions or the comments of a president come up in an infantry unit? How much are you paying attention to the, the, the day-to-day back and forth uh, that the commander in chief is dealing with on the, the political side? Um, well, I would have to say when I deployed under Bush, um, what Bush would say would, would um, get talked about amongst uh, the soldiers, you know, my unit and myself. With Obama, we we didn't really talk about it. Um, and with Trump, I have not deployed um, while Trump has uh, – been in office so it doesn't really it's not a topic of what we really talk about on a regular basis soldiers are more worried about um getting some free time calling up their wives or their friends over you know back here in the states getting some sleep you know reading a book or just getting you know a hot meal Kevin, thanks for the call from el paso best of luck in your final couple months charles is in california good morning good morning gabe how are you doing today? Doing well. Good. Hey, you know what? I wanted to make a couple of comments about some of the, uh, just respond to some of the comments that some of the, the last speakers did. First of all, the commander in chief is not constitutionally required to serve in the military. He satisfied all the requirements, and therefore, I think he's uh, as qualified, and I think he's doing a damn good job. Uh, uh, the next thing I wanted to talk about was about uh, another gentleman mentioned something about about race, and, and I think people in this country have taken this race thing a little bit too far. We've got black Americans, we've got white Americans, Japanese Americans. The thing is, we're all Americans. And people forget about that. And, uh, and that, that's important, that that's what bonds us together. Now, as far as our president's performance, uh, GDP's up, uh, unemployment's down. Uh, across the board, things are going well better for our country. And, and the election of President Trump is, has helped expose what's going on in Washington. Um, and uh, with with this stuff coming out, and for everybody seeing all the bad stuff and the underhanded stuff going on in Washington, now we can work together as a nation to correct that. And I think President Trump made that possible. Had it been Hillary uh, elected, well, then it would all have been swept under the rug, and nobody knew anything about it. So, I think President's doing a great job, and I'm going to continue to support him as our president, just like I did Barack Obama. I didn't really like what he did, but I supported him because he's our president. And, and that's what we should do with Americans. Charles mentions uh, GDP, uh, the headline, uh, the lead story of today's Wall Street Journal. Growth revs as economy rolls on. Consumer spending, business investment helped the U.S. GDP grow at a 4.1 percent clip this spring. That was up from the first quarter's revised growth rate of 2.2 percent. It's the strongest growth since the third quarter of 2014. Here's President Trump from the White House yesterday talking about the economic situation of the country. I am thrilled to announce that in the second quarter of this year, the United States economy grew at the amazing rate of 4.1 percent. We're on track to hit the highest annual average growth rate in over 13 years. 
And I will say this right now, and I'll say it strongly, as the trade deals come in one by one, we're going to go a lot higher than these numbers, and these are great numbers. During each of the two previous administrations, we averaged just over 1.8 percent GDP growth. By contrast, we are now on track to hit an average GDP annual growth of over 3 percent, and it could be substantially over 3 percent. Each point, by the way, means approximately $3 trillion and 10 million jobs. Think of that. Each point, you go up one point, it doesn't sound like much, it's a lot. It's $3 trillion and it's 10 million jobs. If economic growth continues at this pace, the United States economy will double in size more than 10 years faster than it would have under either President Bush or President Obama. And we're talking to veterans only in this first segment of the Washington Journal on this Saturday morning. We want to get your veterans view of President Trump and the Trump administration uh, as you're calling in on regional lines for uh, veterans in the eastern or central time zones, 202-748-8000 in the mountain and Pacific time zones can call in at 202-748-8001. Want to show you some of the headlines that Americans are waking up to this Saturday morning uh, involving veterans. This from the Daily News online from out in Wyoming, a story on the last reunion between uh, two World War II veterans, uh, Army veterans Eugene Morrill uh, and uh, Ira Needham sharing a laugh during a reunion uh, at uh, one of their homes in Pennsylvania. This story from the front page of the Pueblo Chieftain this morning, remembering the forgotten war, focusing on Korean War veterans. And one more focusing on the Korean War in the news yesterday, uh, the return of remains coming to the United States uh, from uh, North Korea. Uh, the story from the Courier out of Ohio focusing uh, on those remains coming back. They're expected uh, to be uh, flown to Hawaii. Uh, the remains uh, being transported to Pearl Harbor where the identification process will begin for those uh, North, uh, those remains returned by North Koreans. It was 55 cases believed to be holding uh, American remains from the Korean War. Uh, one of the pictures from the Wall Street Journal today shows those remains uh, en route. You can see them draped in the United Nations flag there. Defense Secretary Jim Mattis saying on Friday that it's not certain that all the remains are those of Americans. They could include remains of soldiers from allied nations uh, or those of North Koreans. And because of those uncertainties, the returning cases were draped in the United Nations flag, not the American flag. Getting your calls this morning, talking to veterans only. Uh, Steve's been waiting in St. Louis, Missouri. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm going to try to keep this as non-political as possible. Uh, <clears throat> I'm a Vietnam vet. I served in the infantry for one year in Vietnam. I didn't like the military. I was a draftee. I came down with numerous illnesses the last probably 15 to 18 years. And I have to admit, under the current president, what hand he had in this, I don't know. But I will say there has been a distinct change in how veterans are treated. I can go in there. There's been a distinct change. They keep their appointments. I never have to wait. It even seems that their attitude in when you schedule an appointment, are you trying to get medicine? They're very courteous. Um, I'm not going to badmouth President Obama because I did vote for him twice. But it just seems like under President Trump, Whatever he's had to do with this, with his people at the VA, there's been a distinct change. Steve, what did you? I also like the way he always brings up veterans. I don't care if it's a rally or if he's bringing veterans to the White House. I could care less if he served or not. I mean, there's been other presidents that didn't serve. There's many Americans who never served. It doesn't mean I, didn't, I don't like them any less. I mean, I'm glad he didn't have to serve. Steve, coming back to, to the VA, what did you think of, of the previous previous uh, VA secretary, uh, David Shulkin, and, and what are your thoughts on, on the new VA secretary, Robert Wilkie? Well, I, I what I know of the of the, uh, the current one that was uh, 
uh, that just got the position. What I've read, he seems to be a very good man. Very good man. And I'll be honest, under Shulkin, I know there was controversy, but I myself and the group that I belong to, a uh, Vietnam combat veterans organization, we are all in agreement that the last two years, things have changed with the VA. We're treated more like human beings, like you go to a private doctor. Um, there's been horror stories I've heard with treatment, um, even courtesy. When you go in for an appointment uh, um, in the last 10, 12 years, and, and I've experienced it myself also. So I really believe, um, I really believe that President Trump and the administration that he's put together has put veterans uh, as one of his top priorities, and and I'm very pleased. That's all. Steve, thanks for the call this morning uh, on Robert Wilkie. Uh, as we said, he was confirmed on Monday by a vote of 86 to 9. The no votes were from Democratic senators Cory Booker of New Jersey, Kamala Harris, and Dianne Feinstein of California, uh, Kirsten Gillibrand of New York, Elizabeth Warren, uh, and Ed Markey of Massachusetts, Ron Wyden and Jeff Merkley of Oregon, and Bernie Sanders of Vermont. Uh, the story in the Washington Times noting that Mr. Milky, Wilkie will have a massive job ahead of him as he takes over the government's second largest agency. The VA is still experiencing problems with delays and patient wait times to see a doctor. According to a new report from the Government Accountability Office, uh, President Trump touted his Veterans Choice Program uh, for helping ease those delays in his speech on Tuesday, but researchers say reforms to VA's community care programs won't fix the lengthy wait times that the agency uh, that the agency has uh, until the agency improves its data collection and monitoring. Uh, GAO said the choice patient participation can face uh, participants. I'm sorry, can face up to 70 days to receive care uh, due to red tape. If you want to read more from that story, it's in the Washington Times. Back to your calls, talking to veterans only this morning. Your view of President Trump and the Trump administration. Manny, uh, in Daytona Beach, Florida, when and where did you serve? I served from 1960 to 1963. I was at the Army War College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. <clears throat> I was uh, in Scoville Barracks in Hawaii, and I support uh, Donald Trump 100%. You know, he's doing what he said he would do. He's straightening out America. He's draining the swamp, and people don't like it. And if you think about the kind of lifestyle that he had, that he gave up to help the American people, it's ridiculous the way uh, people are criticizing him and tearing him down. You know, the place is a mess. The country's a mess. I mean, you just like trade. Why anybody with common sense would know it has to be fair trade. You know, it can't be you charge uh, Canada charges 280 percent on uh, dairy products. That's just not right. You know, and I support Donald Trump 100 percent. Manny, we're going to be talking uh, a lot more about trade in our eight o'clock hour of The Washington Journal. Stick around for that discussion. The first half hour focusing on farm issues and farmers uh, and the second half hour, a wider discussion on the impacts of trade and tariffs. So that's coming up uh, in about a half hour this morning. Bob, High Springs, Florida. Good morning. When and where did you serve? Good morning. Yes, this is Bob, High Springs, Florida. And uh, my comment, I feel that Trump is restoring our military strength and standing behind American veterans more than ever before. I think that uh, he's bringing home prisoners of war and getting our enemies to return even the remains of veterans that have been held for lots of years. Uh, he's working to make the VA hospitals even better than they are. Um, he's improving the veterans' economic status and helping veterans take uh, get off of food stamps, supporting veterans like four vets and Camp Valor programs, which are severely wounded veterans that I volunteer for. And uh, he's uh, I'm a lifetime AMVETS member, too. And all this instead of what Obama was doing, choosing military leaders like the head of the Air Force being a woman who never even flew a plane and uh, using military in the White House as, as waiters. It was pathetic. I think that, uh, yeah, I was a Vietnam era veteran from 1963 to 67. I was in communications and intelligence, mostly in Europe, but uh, overseas for the four years. Uh, I was... Uh, 
I think that uh, the, the VA hospital system has gotten so much better in the last couple of years. It was a good system. I've been in it for a little over 10 years, maybe 12 years, and it's, it was a good system, and I got good treatment, uh, except for one doctor that I had to basically dismiss because of uh, uh, a poor attitude he had and a poor uh, a neglect of symptoms of prostate cancer for a couple of years, and, and I finally got treated when I got a good doctor. Um, I think the mission statement has changed to make patient care, patient-centered care, even better. Um, they have a mission statement over each person's desk, and they believe in giving the best patient care and treatment that you can get. And I'm finding that's better and better the last couple of years. Uh, I'm very happy with it, and let's see, what else? Um, well, Bob, we'll take the comment. Plenty more people want to chat this morning, including Rick in Idaho, a veteran. Go ahead. Morning, morning John. This is Rick H. and retired governor of the United States Marine, 79 to 2000. America, I got something positive to say about President Trump and his staffers. The president may not know you personally, but he can tell you what you have in your wallets and your purses. You have not enough of, barely enough to get by, or food stamps, which is unacceptable. So I give you fair warning, my friends. He's here to put the pork back on your plate, pork back in your belly, and the pork back in your wallet, and you can bank on that. So when I say it's time to yank you up, folks, you know I'm bored. The money train is here because President Trump is the engineer. With that in mind, John... Thanks for your hospitality, and God bless President Trump for trying to make America safe, wealthy, and great again. Have a good one, John. Thank you. You have a good one, too. Rick Allen, Hartwell, Georgia veteran. Go ahead. Good morning, John. Good morning, America. Uh, yeah, I was in the Air Force from 1969 until 1991. And what do you think of, the, uh, uh, what do you think of President Trump? Uh, well, I think he's an insult to our electoral process. Uh, he's an insult to veterans, and he's he's an insult to Americans in general. That's my opinion. Why do you use the term insult, Alan? Because uh, he is not what we envision when we envision a president. And I say president because uh, we elect a president. Uh, we don't elect a commander-in-chief. Commander-in-chief is just... Uh, a duty that they have to perform uh, in times of war, uh, and uh, Trump is uh, not a pres- he's not presidential material, basically. Alan, who do you think in in your lifetime performed that commander in chief duty the best while in office? Oh, that's a difficult question. Uh, we haven't had that many, uh, you know, real wars. Uh, Vietnam, when I was uh, in Vietnam and, in, you know, prior to and after, uh, that was mostly Nixon. Uh, and I suppose he probably uh, was a, a fairly decent uh, commander-in-chief uh, but, uh, you know, it would take something like a world war for uh, that uh, ability to be a commander-in-chief to really stand out. So I can't uh, really think of too many presidents we've had uh, who effectively uh, were commanders-in-chief. Alan, thanks for the call from Hartwell, Georgia, this morning. Again, veterans only in this first hour of the Washington Journal. 202-748-8000 if you're a veteran in the eastern or central time zones. 202-748-8001 if you're a veteran in the mountain or Pacific time zones. We'll take this conversation until the top of the hour with veterans only. Uh, We'll also look for your uh, tweets and comments on Twitter. Uh, It's at CSPANWJ. Parkstorm writes in this morning, no self-respecting veteran who values honor, integrity, and leadership could support Trump. Uh, Lizzie writes in this morning uh, about the remains returning from North Korea. There will be many more remains of our soldiers returning. Thank you, President Trump. God bless you. And Donna saying every single vet under every single president should get the best care after the sacrifices that they have made. Shelton is waiting in Shreveport, Louisiana. Good morning. Well, one thing I want to say is that uh, uh, the VA um, and the most part is is pretty good. It's pretty good. But uh, 
as as um, a president goes, generally all of them have uh, used uh, poor people, working class people, as cannon fodder, uh, and fighting these wars to redistribute the uh, wealth in the world. Uh, and um, although the GDP is up, uh, poverty is is steady on the increase. Wages is still stagnant. Uh, a, a large chunk of veterans are still homeless. Uh, it, 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 uh, uh, we, we, we see uh, a continuous, endless wars in in our society. That that's that's not good. Uh, we should be working for to have a world where a vast majority of people in our society can live together as brothers and sisters and not be uh, uh, at the beck and call of the multinational corporations and, and uh, fighting wars for the very rich. Um, all of them, uh, Obama uh, um, continued the war that Bush uh uh, started, uh, and we're still in Afghanistan for for over 17 years. That's that's terrible. And 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 young people and men and women in, that that barely t- uh, past 21 years old are still dying. That's not a good thing. And and our, and our environment is terrible. Um, we should be working uh, together on, on in this planet. All of us should be living together working together but the, Shelton wh- why did you join the military I did join I was drafted and that's that's one of the things that happened uh, to a lot of people well, back in the Vietnam era they, they were told a lie we were told a lie uh, 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 about Vietnam uh, we were told a lie uh, uh, and uh, in, in, uh, in in the whole uh, fight over over uh, Olivia, uh, uh, young people, like I said, young people and, and, and uh, working class people have been fighting these wars throughout the centuries. Their grandfathers, his grandfather, my father, and on down the line. Clarence is in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Good morning. Yes, sir. Um, and good morning. Um, the Donald Trump, uh, you could put any Republican president in and you'll get the same. Republicans are generally strong uh, supporters of the military. Make no mistake about it. Uh, Trump, the man, he's a he's a traitor. Uh, He stood up there with uh, Vladimir Putin. That almost, almost made my stomach turn. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. And I, I joined the military during the Cold War. And the first thing they used to say, Trump this, uh, the first thing they used to say, Russia this, Russia that. So in my honest opinion, Trump, the policymaker towards the military is great. No doubt about it, hands down. But once again, you can have any Republican that uh, that supports strongly supports the military, but as far as um, the policy, as far as the man, he's a disgrace. He's a traitor, and all. And and I'll put it this way: all these veterans calling in that support him, look at the demographics. I hate to put it that way, but look at the demographics, and you can pretty much see who his strong supporters are. Uh, Clarence, what, get... what are you implying? Because uh, we haven't actually asked the the demographics of no, individual you callers. You can hear it through the. I know you haven't. You can hear it through the phones. You know what? You could you could tell who who supports them and who doesn't. Who's not a strong supporter? If Obama did a, a third of what this guy's done, you you would hear public outrage. But all of a sudden, these strong military guys they turn their heads. I'm not going to turn my head. I see what's happening. And I'm a strong supporter of the military. I love the military. But this guy here taking five deferments, I just don't understand it. That's Clarence in Virginia. Skip is in Valley Springs, California. Good morning. Good morning. 
Thank you for taking my call. Um, I'm definitely not a Trump supporter. I, I, I was in Vietnam. I'm 72 years old. And uh, after I got back from Vietnam, I, I avoided the Veterans Administrations like the plague because it was just horrible. But, but it did improve a lot through um, uh, various uh, presidents up to this time. And I've been fairly happy with the, um, uh, the Veterans Administration. But Steve, now who, do you, I see, who do you think improved the VA the most? What do I think? Who do you think, which uh, president improved the VA the most? I think it was um, during um, uh, the first Bush and, uh, the, and Clinton, that's when I seemed to see a lot of things start happening that were good for veterans. I started going to them on a regular basis. I was getting very good uh, support as far as um, uh, preventative medicine. You know, I'm a diabetic, and they've done a good job of uh, controlling my diabetes. Uh, but now I see that uh, this president supports all this privatization, privatization um, because he's an idiot. Um, <laughs> Because I've tried to use this private system they're trying to push on us now, and it's been, as far as I can see, it's been a disaster. I've been better off with the uh, the doctors I've seen directly in the Veterans Administration, and I've seen two doctors now. Um, right now, I'm trying to get cataract surgery, and the VA said, "Okay, you have you go 40 miles further than you need, more than 40 miles, so you can go to." A, private doctor. I went and saw a private doctor. They did another exam, which a VA already did, and determined, yes, you have the, you need cataract surgery. They turn around and tell me, well, we don't support, uh, we don't uh, uh, handle it with the VA. We don't do cataracts for the VA. Well, what the hell would they do in sending me to a place? <laughs> you know, so they just wasted my time, probably a, a lot of money, and now i got to go find another eye doctor, and I found one that said, yes, we will do the VA, but now they won't. I can't go because I already went to one, they say, and i got to go through all the process paperwork again, over again. And this is what we're going to get for privatization. Skip, on the issue of privatization, uh, a story from military.com uh, recently from uh, uh, late last month on this topic. More than 30 veteran service organizations have backed Senate proposals to fund the recently passed VA Mission Act, which expands private health care options. The proposals, which are opposed by the White House, would give uh, up to $55 billion in funding over five years. The bill, signed into law by President Trump earlier this month, provided $5.2 billion in funding to keep the current Veterans Choice and Accountability Act running through next May, while the Department of Veterans Affairs puts in place the VA Mission Act. The Choice Program uh, pushes some veterans to private care in lieu of care at VA hospitals or clinics, while the Mission Act aims to overhaul choice and consolidate some programs. The Mission Act also lifting restrictions on caregiver be benefits for disabled veterans. Uh, the caregiver benefits program has been limited to post 9-11 veterans, but the VA Mission Act opened it up to veterans of all eras. If you want to read more, military.com uh, with that story. Don's waiting in Illinois. Don, thanks for waiting. Good morning. Good morning to uh, C-SPAN. Good morning to America. Um, I'm a veteran. My father was a veteran. My I have four or five brothers who are veterans and a slew of cousins. So we served this this country uh, very well. And I get so upset when I see veterans who support this president, a president that has traitors is shown to be a traitor, has secret meetings with the Russians. And, and it's, it's, just, it's just terrible. And as far as veteran houses, my brother was a Vietnam veteran. And uh, that's when we lived in Michigan. And I would take him to Saginaw to the Veterans Hospital you know, for his appointments and things like that. And before he passed, I mean, we got very, very good care from the Veterans Administration on meeting. They actually even sent a uh, person out to to help him on to get his medicines together and things like that to to his uh to his house. So 
I mean, it's a big organization, and you're going to have problems in anything that's big. But uh, the Veterans Administration treated my uh, family and family members uh, very well. Very well. Sebastian is in California. Go ahead, Sebastian. Uh, yes. Uh, good morning, John. Uh, thank you so much for your C-SPAN broadcast. I listen to it all the time on Saturday. Appreciate that. I am in support of uh, President Trump. I think he's an excellent president. Uh, he has, I think, a military bearing and posture. And uh, it's just it's just I'm so happy to see somebody in charge and telling people what to do. And if he doesn't like something, he lets them know that as well. So uh, to me, as a veteran, uh, and I think that most veterans uh, understand that behavior, uh, he uh, uh, has a military posture and a military bearing. And I'm just glad he's up there. Sebastian, explain that a little bit more. What's a, what is a military posture, a military bearing? Uh, what he does is he takes command. Uh, he takes command of uh, himself when he's giving orders to his staff, uh, when he's coming up with his programs. Uh, that's a, a military posture. Military bearing would be he looks like he's military. He is in control of himself. Even though people are complaining about his various comments, I, I believe that President Trump's comments are purposeful. And I think that he's getting the job done and moving the country forward. Sebastian, on, on, uh, his, on Tuesday when he was at the VFW uh, convention, you can see some of the video from it. One of the things he, he talked about and got some criticism for is his continued criticism of the, the press. Uh, the story on the front page of the Washington Post today focusing on President Trump uh, and how he treats the press. Trump has repeatedly sought to punish the press is the headline there. Uh, what do you think about the president uh, and his treatment of the press? And, and what do you think the, the veterans of this country think about the press right now? Well, uh, I think that his comments and his um, criticism of the, of the press is fair. I mean, who else is going to battle back? The press is coming forward with the battle. Uh, accusing him of this, accusing him of that, and uh, who's going to defend him? He has to defend himself, and he has to defend his government. And I think that uh, veterans, uh, the majority of them, are in line with him uh, because it's just common sense what's going on between him and the press. The press doesn't like him. He doesn't like the press. That's the bottom line. <laughs> A tweet from the VFW National Headquarters after that uh, the remarks by the president on Tuesday, uh, they tweeted after the president's speech today, we were disappointed to hear some of our members boo the press during President Trump's remarks. We rely on the media to spread the VFW message and CNN, NBC News, ABC, Fox News, CBS News and others on site today were our invited guests. We were happy to have them there, more focused on uh, President Trump, uh, veterans and the press in Martha Raddatz piece from Thursday in the Washington Post. She writes that I've covered this nation's wars for decades, working side by side with our soldiers, sailors, Marines and airmen. I'm proud to have gained the hard won respect of so many of those that I've met over the years. But as I listen to the vitriol aimed at the press by our president, I worry that those days of mutual respect will disappear for the next generation of reporters. She says Trump's rally before hundreds of veterans at the Veterans of Foreign Wars convention Tuesday in Kansas City, Missouri was especially disturbing. Have those veterans who booed and taunted the media in response to Trump's cue forgotten that some members of the press corps are combat veterans? And when President Trump boasts that he will fix the Department of Veterans Affairs, has, have his supporters forgotten the attention that the press has drawn to those very issues? If you wanna read Martha Raddatz's piece, Thursday in the Washington Post, the July 26th edition. Bethany is a veteran in Ohio. Good morning. Good morning, John. Go ahead, Bethany. Um, hi, hi there. Um, you know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm an older gal. I served uh, during the uh, Reagan years. And um, I, I, I just got to tell you, I think uh, a lot of these, I go to the, the Veterans Administration um, on a weekly basis, and I try my best to talk to everyone about politics and what they believe. And um, one of, um, there, there are so many, there are so many approaches here. One of the um, things that concerns me the most is that abs absolute um, uh, antagonistic nature and promiscuous lying that everyone is well aware of. Um, I think of, uh, 
a, a lot of these veterans, I, I suspect that they may be identifying with the president, you know, that they're older men, they're cantankerous, they don't want to be told what to do. They want to be able to grab women when they feel like it, and they don't much care to be told that they're wrong. And I think that they are um, living almost vicariously through his uh, his uh, power. And um, the, the VFW thing, that was absolutely disgraceful. I just, I cannot believe that we're so easily brainwashed. And no one even knows that, or, or the veterans don't seem to know that, like one of the first uh, things when he was in, president, uh, in, in the presidency was that he tried to cut benefits. Like me, I've got cancer and I've got PTSD and, you know, I'm at the end of my life right now. And I'm a fairly young woman, or at least I think I am. Um, and I'm, I'm going to uh, uh, go out of this world uh, watching this. I, I just, I cannot forgive the absolute misogyny that he has bred in this country. And I see it everywhere. And I see it, I've just moved to Ohio from Colorado um, after living there for 30 years. And it's like the Mason-Dixon line has crept northward. And, and, um, and uh, the racism in this part of the country, it, from when I left here in the 80s, it's just, it's overwhelming. And Bethany, the Masa- why do you think it's important to talk politics every time you go to, to the VA? Do, do you think, what, what difference because do you think you're making? nobody wants to do it. Nobody wants to do it. Nobody wants, they, I know that I've annoyed so many people and they're like trying to get rid of me. And I'm like, I'm, I keep my mouth shut and I'm like, it's your chance to tell me what you think, go. And they have nothing to say. They, they can't tell me why they hate Pelosi. There's no reason to hate Pelosi. What did she do? She, she's, um, oh my God. I just go on and on and on. Let, you should probably let someone else talk now, dear. <laughs> it's Bethany in Ohio this morning. Bethany, our first female veteran to call in during this veterans only segment. Some more numbers from the Pew Research Center, specifically uh, on the demographic profile of veterans expected to change in the next few decades. Currently, nine in 10 veterans, 91 uh, percent are men, while nine percent are women. By 2045, the share of female veterans is expected to double to 18 percent. Back to your calls, Uh, less than 10 minutes left in this veterans only segment as we get your view of President Trump and the Trump administration. Mike Wilmington, Delaware, thanks for waiting. Uh, Nice to take my call. Uh, Yeah, I think uh, President Trump's doing a a great job. Uh, uh, That said, uh, I mean, uh, America was great before he came to office. I mean, everybody's got... You know, he's a businessman, you know. Uh, he's worried about, you know, uh, his name. I mean, uh, uh, Mike, what did you think about the concerns you, expressed by that caller before you as you were waiting? Uh, the lady, uh, well, uh, you know, uh, I really, uh, I was uh, in the military. I remember when I saw my first, uh, when I was uh, combat arms most of the time and uh, uh it uh you know it, it's like anything else when you know uh something's new i mean you know you say well you know you well, you know uh in the military the military's been all men in combat arms for the longest you know so uh uh it, it takes uh, time and now it's now it should be just about the norm. I mean, uh, uh, there's a lot more, but, uh, uh, we, uh, uh, uh our, uh, military along around the world, you, you got to take an account that, uh, uh, it's just been 1% that's been <laughs> fighting ISIS, uh, since Iraq, they cut down Iraq. There's only 37,000, uh, what they said, heard the other day in the, in Europe, it used to be 300 and some thousand, you know, our footprint there. So, you know, uh, uh, I, 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 uh, uh, I believe that, uh, uh, I believe that, uh, we were in force modernization under Reagan, uh, that brought all that material on. It ended up in Iraq, uh, and they ended up, 
the Iraqis ended up giving it away to ISIS, and we had a new problem. Um, you know, it's, uh, there's just uh, it's really is hard to uh, you know manage. It's hard to uh, for people to remember that uh, it's the people's uh, the people's money that's uh, paying for all this uh, military hardware. And uh, Mike, to your concern about the. Uh, few Americans who actually serve in the military, uh, some numbers on uh, the number of veterans who serve in Congress. You can see uh, the percentage of members in the House and Senate uh, that were veterans declining over the years. Uh, today in the current Congress, 20% of senators and 19% of representatives had prior military ex uh, experience or service. Uh, the share of senators uh, who are veterans reached a post-Korean War peak uh, in 1975 when it was 81%, while the share among House members peaked uh, in 1967 uh, at uh, 75%. If you want to see any of these numbers, uh, the Pew Research Center with their facts on the changing face of America's veteran population. Time for a few more calls from veterans. Chris is in DeBerry, Texas. Good morning. And now I'm 7071. Uh, it breaks my heart that people are calling in here, uh, running everything that uh, Trump has done down. He's done more than anybody, really. He's catching up with Reagan quick and even and fast for the country, so the so people can live better and there's more jobs. There's uh, they can't fill the jobs. I don't understand what people are complaining about. Are they all they're still on welfare calling in? And for a soldier, especially a combat soldier, to call in complaining about being alive, you're not going to hear that. So these people are calling in. I don't think they ever got shot at or ever returned any fire anyway. But let me just say that we got to stand up for our country because Russia and China are working together, and I hope it doesn't happen. But when it does, we're going to be in the, in the worst fight that we've ever been in. And it might even some of it be on this land. Chris, is President that. Trump standing up to Russia and China? And I'm glad he is because they're, they're really taking advantage of us and have been ever since Clinton. He's the one that opened the door to them and said, here, come on in, have everything we got. And they've been doing it ever since because of the money. To Michael, Sydney, Ohio. Michael, good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'm a veteran, uh, 73 years old. My wife's also a veteran. Uh, economically, we're uh, fortunate, more fortunate than most. So I have no complaints one way or another about how Trump is doing with the economy. But I do have an observation that uh, Trump, I used to listen to him for years on the Don Imus show. And this guy has not changed one bit. Blow hard, a liar. I mean, the guy is just I can't stand him. And the way he plays, uh, I mean, his people to support him, it's just, it says so much about them that he constant, constantly lies, the big lie, you know, just, and anybody can check it out, but everything, you know, they don't, they choose not to believe it because it's, uh, it's just, uh, they, they just can't, I don't know, they, they can't face the truth or they don't want to, and I don't really think that um, that he's going to do anything long term, but hurt our country. Certainly not help it. Michael, uh, what about what about the role he plays as commander in chief? <laughs> That's a joke. Are you kidding me? I mean, come on, commander in chief. This guy was a draft dodger. He, uh, I mean, he he did not do anything except insult the military. Look, look what he said about the uh, Gold Star family. I mean, just because they were not uh, white. Now, I'm white, but uh, I've known for years because of the field. I, I was in the medical field. My wife still practices anesthesia. I'm telling you, this is such a racist country. It really is. It always has been. It's changed very little. There's a thin veneer of respectability over people you would think would be too educated to be racist. But they're still racist, a lot of them. That's Michael in Ohio. Tyrone is in Georgia, Savannah, Georgia. Tyrone, go ahead. Yeah, this is 
Tyrone. Uh, I was just listening to the comment from the gentleman uh, just before I got online that uh, he was talking about the racism in the country. And uh, I was thinking about, uh, I'm a veteran, I'm a Vietnam vet. Uh, hello? And what did it make, make you think about, Tyrone? I was, think, I was thinking about that, uh, you know, when he said the, about the racism in this country, I was wondering maybe if all the people that were separated at the border, if they were blonde haired and blue eyes, would they, would, they, would they have been separated because they were of Mexican descent, that they were separated from there, and most of them haven't even really got back with their parents. I mean, how do you do children that way? And I mean, the things that happen in El Helsinki, uh, to me, borderline on treason. And like one of the gentlemen said that Donald Trump's never been in the military. He was a de- draft sergeant. He don't really care about this country. He cares about himself and his family. I mean, his, his basically, I feel like it, his whole family is traitors. That's Tyrone in Savannah, Georgia. Tyrone, to your first point on family separation, some of the latest numbers being reported in today's Wall Street Journal, the Department of Health and Human Services identified 2,634 minors who were separated from their families at the border. Uh, Of that uh, 2,531 were children five to 17, 103 were children under the age of five. Uh, Of those under the age of five, 57 have been reunited, 46 uh, not due to uh, various ineligible for reunification uh, reasons, including uh, the adult being outside the U.S. or a red flag from uh, a background check or the fact that the adult couldn't be uh, found. Of those aged five to 17, 1,820 have been reunited, uh, 711 deemed ineligible for reunification. Those are some of the latest numbers. We'll keep updating you uh, as those reunifications continue. But that's gonna do it for this first segment of the Washington Journal today.